Okay, hello everyone. This is again John Vito, and welcome to another episode of Langbytes, your video cast about computational linguistics. And in today's episode, we have the privilege of talking to Jeremy Dickinson. So um, he grew up in Long Island, New York, and growing up there, um, he was surrounded by different cultures that led him to find his passion for languages. And then um, he had a, a BA in Spanish language and literature, and now he's transitioning to artificial intelligence and tech. Uh, he's finishing, finishing his dual master's degree in Hispanic linguistics and computational linguistics. And over the years, he has studied multiple languages, multiple languages. And his goal is to combine his knowledge with math, statistics, and programming, so that he can find a role that lets him have an impact on people's lives through language and technology. That's amazing. And now he's working as a data science intern for a company that aims to make work better every day for people through their software. So again, Jeremy, thank you for coming and thank you for accepting the invitation. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here. And I think uh, this is a really great initiative uh, that you're doing. So oh, thank it's you. it's great. Um, so um, your first, I, I selected two random questions to you, actually, mm -hmm. and for those who don't know, uh, the random question is when I ask a kind of a personal question to the guest. So your first question is, uh, what is your favorite place in your city and why? Yeah, I would say here, um, so I live in uh, Bloomington, Indiana, because I'm going to uh, Indiana University. Um, and it's really hard to pick one, uh, but I would say that I really like uh, the campus. The campus is beautiful. There, there's so many places uh, mm -hmm. on campus where you can sit and kind of be surrounded by nature. Um, so if you need a little break from from the studies in the classroom, you can take a walk through uh, through some of the trails that they have on campus. And uh, there's a little stream uh, on campus as well. And, and that's really nice to to sit by. So I, I'll, I'll go with that, but it's a hard choice. Yeah. Good, good. I love my campus as well. I mean, from my university. Uh, and the second question I have, is what languages can you speak? And I'm asking that to guys, um, because before um, we started recording, uh, Jeremy and I were talking in Portuguese and his Portuguese is very, um, he's very fluent in Portuguese. That's it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say I feel pretty comfortable speaking in, in Spanish and Portuguese. Um, mm -hmm. I studied Italian for, for a while too. And um, I think with a little bit of, uh, kind of refreshing, I could get back to a pretty comfortable conversational level. Mm -hmm. um, and I've studied, a, you know, a bunch of other languages, but as they say, like, if you if you don't use it, you lose it. So, um, so yeah, I haven't practiced uh, a lot of those languages recently, but um, yeah, Spanish uh, and English and Portuguese and Italian. Nice. Probably. And yeah. um... Do you study Portuguese and Spanish in your uh, master's or only Spanish? Uh, so I personally only study uh, Spanish. I've taken a lot of courses on, uh, for example, Spanish syntax, um, semantics, mm -hmm. uh, phonology, sociolinguistics, uh, a lot of those different areas. But uh, the department does offer some, some Portuguese classes and some uh, kind of events for Portuguese speakers. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So now we are going to move on to the questions about computational linguistics and new journey. Great. So question would be, um, could you share with us some insights into your academic journey and how did your interest in computational linguistics and Hispanic linguistics develop and what motivated you to pursue a master in this? Yeah, um, so, I grew up on Long Island, New York, and growing up there, um, there were a lot of kids who had come from specifically Central America, so um, El Salvador and Honduras. Uh, and growing up there and, and being there in school, um, a lot of them 
didn't know that much English when they when they arrived, and um, I didn't know any Spanish, you know, from growing up. But uh, we would see each other, uh, you know, in the hallway a lot, or or take the bus together, and uh, we would just teach each other words. I, I thought it was so sad that we couldn't communicate, um, you know, and I couldn't imagine what it could what it must have been like for them moving to a country where. Um, you know, they couldn't speak the language. And, and so we would use, you know, translators on our phones or dictionaries, or we would just point at things and say the word for it and laugh at each other with the pronunciation. Um, and so that's kind of what got, got me started with, uh, with, with Spanish and, and some of the other languages uh, from there, you know, high school and, and undergrad, I just dove into languages as much as I could. You know, I did uh, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese. I took uh, German classes, and and um, like every Saturday in high school, I would I would travel to a language school to take uh, some language classes, and um, and so that's kind of how I got into into uh, ling linguistics, and uh, my passion for Spanish is what um, mm -hmm. really led me to get into like Hispanic linguistics. Uh, and uh, the, tra the transition from uh, Hispanic linguistics to computational linguistics, that was, um, that was an interesting one. You know, I, I hmm. took a class called Language and Technology uh, at Stony Brook University. And uh, there they kind of introduce you and uh, tease you with some of these ideas of, of like conversational AI and, and things like that. Um, and it was really kind of an intro to Python course, uh, um, working with with some text and and things like that. And um, I, I was, I really fell in love with that, and I, I really enjoyed it. But um, I, I think I was kind of scared, and I lacked a lot of confidence in in being able to uh, to kind of get into the world of computational linguistics, NLP and, and machine learning. And, um, uh, and so eventually, you know, I, I came here to IU to study Hispanic linguistics and, um, you know, it, it, it took a little bit of, uh, a little bit of, um, me pushing myself outside of my comfort zone to, uh, be able to, uh, apply for, uh, for the computational linguistics program here and, and kind of get into that world. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and is computational linguistic a strong field at your university? Like, yeah. Uh, is it bad? Would... There, there are many professors. Um, I would say there are, I think there's maybe about three or four main professors, you know, some teach, uh, they rotate the courses that they teach. And, um, you know, some of them advise, for example, PhD students, and I think some of them also just lecture. Uh, but I think it's definitely growing. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's growing a lot. Uh, and that's pretty exciting to see. Yeah, we need. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Great. Um... And you are graduating in your master's degree very soon. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would like to know what were some of the most significant challenges you faced during your academic uh, journey in computational linguistics and how did you overcome them? Yeah, I really like this question a lot um, because I think like, especially for, um, for people that come from a language background or linguistics, like this uh it's it's an important question like uh, to get the answer to and for me you know like i said middle school high school college i dove into languages and linguistics as much as i could um while also kind of running away from um from math concepts or statistics yeah. or uh, for example, programming, um, not because I, I didn't like it, but, uh, I lacked a lot of confidence and, and, um, and so I think one thing that if I could like give some advice to, 
uh, people that come from a language background and they're trying to get into computational linguistics is, um, is to give yourself the permission to fail um, and to give yourself the permission to be bad at something. Um, mm -hmm. Because I was so scared, uh, you know, I would, in undergrad, when I was just taking Spanish courses, I was so, I was interested in, in learning Python and programming. And I would take these, you know, kind of online little classes and courses that they have. And when I would get something wrong, it, it would, um, it just, for whatever, it just devastated me. And, and it made me want to like close my laptop and, and I would get frustrated. And um, I think like one of the biggest, that was one of the biggest challenges for me to overcome uh, was giving myself the permission to be bad um, and not necessarily bad, but uh, just make mistakes, uh, make mistakes and uh, not know how to do things. Um, and once I got over that, uh, things really started to, um, that's when I really started to make progress because it was like, yeah, let's try this. If I fail, okay, we, we keep going and, and we try to fix it. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I think, I think that's it. Great. And I think that yeah. will, will resonate with a lot of people that does, with a lot of people that do linguistics or language related uh, majors, because usually mm -hmm. um, we choose this kind of major because we don't like math. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah, we and... enjoy doing math. Um, so uh, when you go to computational linguistics and then you have to, to learn programming, statistics, math, algebra, everything mm -hmm. again and in deeper and more complex um, um, subjects, then you are like, mm, I should have studied more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, uh, you might have this feeling of like, man, why did I ignore this stuff? Or why did I run away from this stuff? Yeah. And um, I think if you can just like be honest with yourself and say, look, in the past, maybe I, it was too difficult for me at the time, or I was scared of it, or I just didn't want to know anything about it. Um, and maybe I'm a little scared now, but if you can say like, I, I recognize uh, the, the you, how useful it is and, and the, the role that plays in what we do as computational linguists. And um, if you just have that, uh, if you can kind of develop that resilience of like, uh, I'm, it's going to be hard. I'm not going to understand things at first and mm -hmm. I'm going to scratch my head a lot and I'm going to get frustrated. And um, if you can just kind of put that out there first and, and accept that and say, okay, I'm going to keep going, then you'll get there. You'll yeah, get and there. that's part of the process, you know, failing yeah. and doing it again. And, it, and it's also science, right? Because science exactly. Is that, right. Um, and I believe you agree with me, but uh, doing a master's degree or a PhD in this kind of area is also the moment for you to get these abilities. This mm -hmm. is key. because um, yeah. a, a master's degree or a PhD, they are very project based. So you will learn um, something dedicated to your project. So possible, very likely it will be very interesting to you because it would solve a question that you have but also mm -hmm. you will have more opportunities to do so because you have professors, you have courses, you have uh, labs, you have um, workshops at your university. So um, mm -hmm. these formal kind of studies, they are also um, the, the opportunity for those who don't like math or want to learn math and they are linguistic majors can learn um, those other skill sets. Yeah, and, and like, I like what you said, like, this is where, um, you know, this is like in a master's and PhD program, that's what you're doing. You're, that's kind of why you're there is to get exposure to things that you haven't had exposure to. And um, I think one thing from, uh, you know, from going through from the program at uh, Indiana University is a lot of the, the classes are uh, mixed in some cases where they're listed in the computer science department and also listed in the linguistics department. Um, and because there are actually uh, many more computer science students here than um, linguistic students, uh, you know, even though it's taught by a, a linguistics professor, um, you, there are going to be like 
20 kids in the class from computer science and maybe three or four from, <laughs> uh, from computational linguistics. So uh, interacting with, with them and, and seeing, uh, you know, that kind of the two worlds kind of come together where you have that background as a linguist, they have the background as computer scientists. Um, the, there's a really interesting like exchange of, of skill sets and ideas there where, yeah. um, you know, during those courses, you know, maybe they have had never had any, uh, they don't have any background in language or linguistics and you can share that and, uh, and they can share, you know, Hey, this is a, a matrix. This is a vector. This is, uh, you know, they can share some of the, the mathematical concepts with you and you can really like, uh, come together and, and, uh, blend your skill sets to help each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and since we talked about that, I would like to know a little bit more about your master's degree because now you're transitioning right to the, let's say, to the industry now with mm -hmm. your internship as well. Um, how do you think your master has prepared you for a career in computational linguistics? And are there or were there any specific projects or courses that you found particularly, particularly valuable in shaping your expertise to the market? Yeah, uh, really great question. Um, so we talked a little bit kind of already about like some of the technical skills, I think, like, you know, like what it's like to learn, you know, math and statistics and programming. Um, so I think there are a couple of different skills that aren't technical that, that this program um, helped me develop. Um, so we can, we can kind of put that aside for a second and, um, focus on, on these. And what I think these would be are, uh, being able to like identify a problem, um, or whether it's a research problem or, uh, whether it's the task that you have at hand and, and clearly define it. Um, and then also being able to like break that down into steps of, okay, uh, I have kind of like where I am now and I kind of know what the destination looks like. Like, how do I get to that destination? Um, and some of the destination changes or sometimes you don't know what it looks like, but um, you kind of have like your input. You're like, uh, you know, I know where I am right now um, and I know the direction I need to head in for this project and uh, being able to break down uh, those tasks into, into clear steps. I think that's uh, that's crucial. Um, I guess one more thing I could add, uh, would be, um, being able to clearly communicate, uh, and explain, um, our projects to people outside of, uh, our domains. Um, so I realized how valuable that was during my internship experience when um, you know, I had to give a presentation about kind of, uh, you know, the, the project that I had been working on to people outside of the team that I was on. And, um, you know, to really be able to um, not only explain clearly, but also um, at the same time, convince people about why this project is either beneficial for the company or, um, beneficial as a research project in general, like that is a skill set that um, I think if you develop that and you pair that with some of the really uh, foundational, like technical and, and um, just kind of linguistic knowledge, I think you can, uh, you know, you can be a really powerful candidate, not, not only in industry, but I think also in, in academia, like I, I think that's uh, the storytelling aspect of it and communication is, is really important. Yeah. And also, I believe with this kind of communication skill, you can also um, share your research or your projects with people, like lay people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Things like that. For example, your family members, your friends, that they have no idea what it is, what NLP is, what artificial intelligence or um, computational linguistics. So then you, I don't, I don't believe that you have to tone down what you're saying or to make it 
like they were dumb, but you yeah. can simpler words or you can be more objective, not just many details, not mm -hmm. being technical. So I think that that will help a lot. That will help a lot. Yeah, it's 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 like being able to to bring a lot of these really complex topics, like like break them down into uh, into simpler concepts and kind of like paint that picture with those simple concepts for for people outside of the field. Like that is it's really so valuable and um, and you know there are a lot of people that can write a really good code. Um, and a lot of people that are experts at math and experts at some of the statistics, but, um, I think that in order to distinguish yourself from those people, it's, uh, it's crucial to be able to have that ability to, to mm -hmm. share what you're working on. Um, not only because you can help convince people to either, um, you know, like get behind your project and and support it not not only financially but for example and um you know if you're working in a company uh it's important to have people on board with your project so that they'll be more motivated to collaborate with you on it but also because when you share these ideas you get feedback from people that have different perspectives than you do because they're looking at it uh from their background and yeah being able to get their feedback um sometimes it opens your eyes to things like wow i, I never even thought about that because i'm just so uh you know deep into it that um you know it, it can really open your eyes to some some cool things mm -hmm. great so um now i would like to move forward to um let's say a specific project that you've done. So if possible, I would like you to describe an interesting or innovative project you worked on during your studies or maybe during internship, if possible. Um, and what role did computational linguistics play in that project? Yeah, um, so I worked on a project um, where I trained uh, a model to identify uh, the expression of suicidal ideation um, in Italian. So um, if people, uh, for example, uh, tweet uh, something that may indicate that they're um, considering uh, suicide, um, mm -hmm. that it could identify that. Um, and so you know, that involved a lot of skills from both linguistics and, and kind of computer science, right? That, that computational linguistics perspective, um, because it was, I was doing it for Italian, uh, because I, I don't think it had, uh, ever, ever been done before for Italian. And if it has, um, uh, I couldn't really find anything about it. So, you know, being able to analyze the language from the lens of a linguist and, um, you know, com use my knowledge of Italian there. And then also actually write the code necessary to, um, to both collect the data, uh, process the data, um, and then actually train the, the models. And that was, uh, okay. you know, that was kind of a, a really good project that I think like, mm -hmm. uh, really made uh, good use of kind of my different skills and pushed me to learn things that I didn't yeah. didn't know. And it was yeah. something that you did back to back, right? Yeah, yeah. And it was, uh, it was like during a, a semester for a class. And um, yeah. I actually reached out uh, to uh, some Italian mental health professionals over in Italy and um, uh, communicated with them kind of about some of the the data that I saw and and how to go up because it's a very uh, it's a topic that you have to be very careful with and, and yeah. how you approach it um, and the reason I actually haven't posted it or shared it anywhere is because um, it can be too I, exactly yeah it it's uh, it's a very sensitive topic that has to be handled in a certain way um, but uh, yeah I mean it was kind of that process of okay 
defining what the project is. Uh, okay, collecting the uh, also you know looking at at different research, similar research. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, collecting the data and and writing the the code to collect the data. Um, you know, doing that a linguistic analysis to uh, kind of help differentiate, uh, for example, the uh, suicidal tweets from the non-suicidal tweets, um, and then from there, kind of uh, extracting those features and and building out that that model. Um, and that was like kind of a, an end-to-end project that was uh, mm-hmm. I really learned a lot from it. So that's super nice. Well, mm-hmm. I hope you can find a way to share your project because it seems very interesting. Yeah, it's, um, uh, I would I would really like to continue working on that and and get it to a state where I can um, where I can share it. Yeah, right. Share with us when you do it. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I would like to move on. Um, what you what you're planning for after graduation uh, with your master's degree? So how do you envision applying your skills and knowledge in the real world after graduation? Are you considering, for example, research, industry, or other uh, avenues for your career? Um, there are a bunch of questions here. And aligned with that, how do you see the market for computational linguistics, computational linguists now? And how are you looking for those roles? Yeah, um, so I think I'll actually start with the uh, the last part that you mentioned. Yeah, um, I think, you know, with the kind of explosion of computational linguistics and NLP in the past like year or so with, you know, LLMs and, um, mm-hmm. and a lot of the, the developing technologies, uh, I think that the market is is looking pretty good for computational linguists right now especially um if you find companies that really recognize the value of having someone with a background in language or linguistics um Mm -hmm. so i would say you know i think the market is looking pretty good um it's definitely very competitive as well in, in terms of like the candidate pool um and then also uh, in terms of looking for jobs, I think, aside from using kind of the uh, the traditional like uh, look search through like LinkedIn and and Glassdoor and Indeed and, and some of those platforms, like I think something that's really powerful is being able to uh, network and uh, kind of use, for example, LinkedIn to connect with different people. Um, you know, I I had a recruiter reach out to me uh, because he had seen a post that I had made um, within the past few months. And uh, he just said, you know, I, I saw that post and um, it just got me really curious. And I, I wanted to talk to you to see if you could, if you could be interested in, in a certain role. Um, and so I think there's like a power in kind of creating an online like magnetic presence that uh, actually helps like pull some mm-hmm. of these opportunities yeah. towards you. Um, yeah, do you have any, like, uh, what has that been like for you or what kind of, what do you think about that? Yeah, um, it kind of happened with me. Um, I started posting some more technical um, posts, some technical texts, and then um, someone from a company reached out and then I got the job. It's where- That's I'm awesome, right yeah, now. that's so, great. Um, and then, uh, um, Another recruiter um, reached out to me because I I talked to them about other stuff and then they remembered me because I have uh, networked with them before. That's really cool. Yeah, that it that like just shows like if you if you're active on these platforms in a way that like is uh, is memorable and impressionable, like it can really benefit you. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So. That's really cool. Uh, so, yeah. So that's that answers the the, the last question. second. Yeah, the last question. Circling back, uh, what am I considering now? Um, mm-hmm. So, I'm considering both paths. Um, you know, industry or academia. Um, 
I think one thing I could say kind of about uh, each is uh, whichever route I choose, I really want, and you kind of mentioned this like in the, in the bio, I really want to find um, either a PhD project, kind of a, you know, a topic or a role in industry that allows me to combine my passion for, for languages and, um, and machine learning and um, kind of that intersection of, of computer science and, and language and math uh, to be able to make an, an impact. Um, I think if either my research uh, has an impact and um, people can go to it and, and find it uh, both insightful and, uh, you know, if they can take something from it and, and use it either in their research or, or move forward with it, um, I think I would feel, you know, really fulfilled at that. And, and also the same goes for industry. If I can uh, help or, you know, contribute to a team or a project where I can really clearly see uh, the, the value that uh, we're bringing to the customers, um, yeah. whether it be people or, or other, uh, other companies, uh, I, I think that would make me really feel fulfilled. Like it, it's, uh, kind of that very direct, like, okay, I have language, I have computer science and math, combine those and, um, do something where I can see that the work I'm doing is, is making a positive impact on, on people's lives, either in research or, or, you know, in academia or in, uh, in industry. And great, yeah. great question. Oh, great answer. <laughs> yeah, good. No, you're. That, you, it was a great question. Uh, you're. You're right. Yeah. Um, and now that you've mentioned at the end, um, it has to be something that combines uh, math, linguistics, and computer science. Mm -hmm. so, as you know, uh, computational linguistics is very interdisciplinary. Uh, it's transdisciplinary. You have to have a lot of skills. Um, Again, combining linguistics, computer science, statistics, and etc. So, how do you balance these different aspects in your work and in your projects? Do you try to have them all, or do you have like um, um, friends or colleagues that helps you with uh, mm -hmm. with the skills that you're missing? Yeah, I. So, I think, for example, at my internship. Um, I definitely have a much stronger background in language than I do in, in some of the computer science and, and math aspects. Um, and those are kind of the two areas that I'm really uh, working hard to, uh, to develop a very strong competency in. Um, but, you know, I was able to, to collaborate a lot with some of my, my coworkers um, where I did my internship uh, and you know, they could add, you know, it, it was a combination of both of our skill sets where, um, you know, we, I come from that language and, and linguistics background. They come from the, you know, really advanced training in, in math and statistics. And um, we were able to kind of share those ideas and um, be able to, you know, make that progress on the projects that we were working on. Um, and so, but with you know saying that, I want to also develop that those skills myself, and um, mm -hmm. and so during you know during the week over the summer uh, during my internship, you know I would work Monday through Thursday, and and I would identify some kind of key concepts that I think I needed to uh, to really nail down and and know well, and then I would spend uh, Fridays going to the library and getting some books and uh, trying to kind of, and also using like some YouTube videos and resources to kind of uh, teach myself some of those concepts. And, um, and, you know, I guess, so that was kind of in my experience at the internship and at school, uh, it's pretty similar where, um, you know, some of the courses that I've taken kind of 
demand that knowledge of you and uh, that gives you that that like catalyst or that like impetus to really uh, say okay I have uh, five hours today I'm gonna spend it at the library uh, you know yeah. teaching myself these concepts so yeah good you have to we have to work hard guys yeah it's it's, it's uh it's it's a lot of like resilience and yeah. uh curiosity and and drive i think yeah and and it will be very demanding but i think it will be worth it i'm experiencing that right now as well with my master's degree mm -hmm. it is very demanding but it's what i wanted so yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to remind yourself of that sometimes. You're like, wait, I signed up for this. Yeah, you know, it's my um, fault. yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is, I got myself into this. I have to get myself out of it. Um, yeah. But yeah, like you said, it, it's it's worth it, right? It, um, at the end of the day, when things make sense, and uh, yeah, uh, at the end of the day, when when things make sense, or even if they don't make sense, but you kind of have that sense of like, I worked really hard today, and maybe learned a little bit more uh you realize it's it's definitely worth all the work that we put in yeah great and then um as our last question uh as you're a recent graduate or very soon to be a master's in linguistics um what advice would you give to beginning beginners or aspiring computational linguists who are just starting out their academic journey or considering a career in this field? Oh, that's a good question. And it's so hard to uh, <laughs> try to find like, um, you know, try to find some things that that don't take me like 20 minutes to yeah. uh, explain. <laughs> um, so, okay, I have a list in my head. I'm gonna try to, to work through it. Um, I would say there are three things that mm -hmm. are really important. And I just mentioned them, which uh, are resilience. Um, and so that to me is the ability to, when you don't understand something, when the project doesn't go the way that you're hoping it does or you wanted it to, um, when you're, yeah, having some friction with a group in a, you know, on a group project or your, uh, sitting in class, just kind of feeling a bit lost because, um, yeah, because of the material, like it's being able to say, um, it's okay. I I'm going to, I'm going to keep going. Um, and being able to kind of get up after you fall down and you have those failures. Uh, I think that will bring you really far. Um, mm -hmm. so that's the first one. Uh, the, the second one, uh, I think is curiosity uh, and being able to say like, you know what, I, I don't know this. I want to know it. Um, who can I talk to? Uh, who can I connect with? Whether it's, you know, LinkedIn or online or, um, or someone at, at your university or um, being able to, to kind of have that curiosity to learn what's going on right now in the field, like it, it moved right NLP and computation linguistics, like everything moves so fast yeah. that you, I think you really need that curiosity to, uh, to say, you know what, I don't know about this. It's okay that I'm not an expert in it. Um, I'm going to go learn from, from the people that, that are experts. And um, yeah. So I think that brings you far too. And then can I add something one, there? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, alongside with that, um, learning um you have you have to have curiosity because everything is changing like yeah. today is something tomorrow will be another uh language model that you have to use <laughs> yeah. uh, so alongside with that you also have to learn how to let go yeah because of that because sometimes people get um attached or emotional to a certain a certain method of study or a certain method of research or doing some kind of work and then something better appears and they don't want they don't want to let it go so you have to learn that as well yeah that's great like yeah sometimes you just get comfortable doing things a certain way um like you know you know that this library works uh for this one thing that you want to do and 
And um, for you, yeah, whether it's a, a technology or just a methodology, you kind of get like comfortable with it, right? Yeah. And you're just like, like, oh, do I have to uh, learn this new thing? But um, that's kind of where the, the curiosity comes in, where it's like, mm -hmm. hey, maybe this works better than the method I use now. And, um, so that's a, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go on with your list. No, no, please, no. Um, <laughs> say, add, please, uh, I'm a guest on on your show. Add whatever, uh, whatever, jump in whenever. Um, yeah, my list, uh, I, I think like the last one there is is being kind of driven or, or determined. Um, and I think if you can, you know, if you combine all of those things together, it, it's like waking up every day saying, um, I'm going to do this, I'm driven, I'm determined, I'm going to work hard. And when I fail or when I get stuck, I'm going to keep pushing through the failures. And and um, and then also on top of that, I'm, I'm going to, uh, you know, to keep an open mind to learn these new technologies. And like you said, like, uh, maybe move away from uh, the methods that I'm most comfortable with or that I just get used to using. And uh, I think if you can do all of that, like the math will come, the, the programming will come. Like if you're a linguist, right? If you're coming from that perspective, mm -hmm. like, you know, you'll learn the technologies, you'll learn the programming, um, you'll, you'll learn the math, the linear algebra, like that'll come um and it and it will come it will come you know much easier i think if you can you use those three those three like skills like the, the resilience the curiosity and the drive like that will just facilitate um mm -hmm. like growth in those areas i think yeah great great trip great tips uh, something yeah. I, I would add that uh, that I haven't said in previous episodes would yeah. be um, at the same time that you're studying math the statistics programming that are very important skills for computational linguists don't forget to study linguistics as well because you're a yeah. professional linguist and what makes you stand out from data scientists, mm -hmm. computer scientists, um, um, people from the computer sciences, um, is your knowledge about language. And, and not only language like um, being bilingual or multilingual, but also your technical knowledge, your scientific knowledge about language. So don't let it go. Don't let it like stay flat. So always try mm -hmm. to advance that as well. If you don't want to do a master's or a PhD, try to keep up with um, with the recent articles that are being published, or try to find uh, the newest version of of textbooks. So mm -hmm. I, I would add that as well. Yeah, and I I really love that um, because you know I've taken a lot of classes with um, a lot of people from the you know, computer science, data science departments here, here at IU and um, the exposure that they get in their, their classes to what it means to work with language data is, um, you know, oh, maybe you do some uh, sentiment analysis, right? And, and I think if, uh, I think if you can learn about, you know, different languages work in different ways, right? A lot of, you know, they share a lot of similar underlying structures and, and concepts, but, um, you know, you have to approach Arabic data in a different way than you approach Spanish data. And, and, um, and you know, re recognizing like not all language data is the same. And um, like you said, kind of having that scientific knowledge, like that will, really help you stand out if, if you're coming from that, uh, you know, computer science, data science side, um, that, you know, you'll, you'll do better work and, and, you know, I think your solutions will be more informed. Um, yeah. and so, yeah, that's a really good point. I like that a lot. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So folks, uh, that's it for today. Um, thank you very much, Jeremy. It was a lovely conversation. It was great meeting you. And I'm sure people who are watching could get a lot of good tips from you today as well. Uh, well, thank you so much for you know having me on your show. I, again, I think this is a really great initiative that you have to, um, you. yeah, to have all these, you know, these different people on and have them share their experiences about uh, and knowledge about computational linguistics. It's just really great. So thank you. You're welcome. I didn't have that, so I want other people to have it. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so again, thank you very much. And folks, stay tuned because next week there will be another episode. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.